G'day, in this video series we're going to look at Autodesk's Fusion 360 with a focus on using the program for woodworking. If you don't know, Fusion 360 is a CAD program similar to SketchUp, though in my opinion much more powerful. It's available for Mac and PC. It's also available free for students, enthusiasts, hobbyists and startups, uh, so long as you meet the terms and conditions, which is less than $100,000 US in revenue per year. It's a one year license, but at the end of that one year, you can just select the same license again, so long as you meet the conditions. When you fire up Fusion 360 for the first time, it'll look something like this. So there might be a login section and all of that. On the left hand side here, we've got the Project Explorer. At the moment, this is blank, but I can navigate throughout my account and find a whole bunch of other projects I've worked on in the past. For now, we don't need this open, so I can just close the data panel, though anytime I need it back, I can just click the nine square things. I'm not gonna go into all the pros and cons of Fusion versus say SketchUp or other software at this stage. Uh, I'm primarily gonna focus on the operation inside Fusion, and you can make up your own mind whether it's the right software for you. To start off with, it's best to probably look at the interface. So this is the toolbar at the top and the first option is the workspaces tab. So we're going to work primarily in the model workspace, but in future episodes we'll look at the render, animation and cam workspaces. To the right of the workspace tab we have our basic tool commands and this is very similar to the ribbon in Microsoft Office uh, where you've only got a few options available and the drop down gives us all the other options. To be honest this works out pretty well because depending on what you're designing, you're not going to use all of these options. One thing we will use a lot of is sketch dimensions, and that's down the bottom of the sketch drop down menu thing. However, we can add that easily to the toolbar just by pressing that up arrow. And if we decide we don't like it later on, we can just press the X to get rid of it. I'm going to leave it up there because as I said, it is something we're going to be using. Below that, we've got the uh, kind of file browser, object browser, uh, and that's easier to demonstrate when we add in a few primitives. So we can see there, there's that body, that rectangle or well, cube I just made, and I can hide that. At the bottom center, we've got our basic camera operation. So we've got uh, different views, uh, grid layouts, visual styles. I like to leave it unshaded with the visible edges and I like my camera on orthographic rather than perspective. Uh, we've got our history here so we can roll back to when the file was first created versus that rectangle and that'll become a little bit more apparent why you have that history later on. In the top right hand corner the final thing that we need to look at is the basic camera operation. So if I get that cube up again, uh, while you can pan and rotate uh, using other tools, I find that rotating with this camera control is a lot easier to keep your reference point. For now, we're going to leave that on the home. In this video specifically, we're going to look at creating a bookcase. Although I said I wouldn't do much in the way of comparison, if we look at SketchUp and AutoCAD and a lot of the older style CAD, they're known as direct modeling, whereas Fusion 360 is a parametric modeling program. So by that, I mean that we have parameters that we can enter in and then do our modeling based off that. So if we go to modify change parameters, and again, I'm gonna add that to my toolbar, I can start adding some parameters in now. Now there's nothing here and it might be a little confusing to start off with, but hopefully it highlights some of the power. Now I don't know how tall my bookcase is gonna be, but I know that each shelf, I wanna have 300 millimeters. I'm going to make this out of plywood, so I'm going to make my material thickness 19 millimeters. And I know that I want five shelves, so I'm going to go shelves, units, shelf count. That's probably a better expression. I'm going to just make that five. Now, before we dive into it, we can create things in one of two ways. We can use primitives like this box here. And this is much more similar to uh, SketchUp, but I find it's quite limiting. So instead, we're going to use Sketches. So we go to Create Sketch. I want to look at the front view of our bookcase. And now we're going to do a 2D representation of what our 
bookcase is going to look like. So I'm going to select a rectangle and I'm just going to go for the overall dimensions. So let's put in 800 and I don't know, 500 seems like a good width. Now I actually don't know what these two values are going to be. 500 I'm pretty happy with, but, but 800 is going to be a little bit impossible to get five shelves with 300 mil spacing. So I'm going to create another value called bookcase height. And that's going to be shelf height plus material thickness by shelf count. I'm going to change this parameter here to be equal to bookcase height. That FX there designates that this is a bound property or a constrained property. So if I change what the value of uh, bookcase height is over here, so let's say I add plus 100, it grows by 100. Now our bookcase typically will have two long sides, so let's add in our sides. And I'm just dragging down a rectangle and I'm going to make the thickness of that uh, material thickness. For now we're going to stop the sketch. Clicking the home view gives us a good uh, 3D representation of what we're looking at. And now we can start extruding things. But before we do, again we're going to add another parameter. Uh, bookcase depth. I want my bookcase to be 300mm deep. Now I can either use this button here to extrude or hit E for extrude. I'm going to select the top and the bottom. And I'm going to extrude them by bookcase depth. This will automatically hide our sketch, so we go into the object browser and turn that back on. The little light globe on or off will show or hide things. Again, I'm going to extrude, this time the two uh, long edges. And before I hit uh, OK, I'm going to change that from join to new body. If I was to choose join, this would create one big body with a hole in the middle rather than four discrete objects. This is looking like a basic bookcase, or well, it's the case for the bookcase. We don't have any shelves in it at the moment. So if we go to our sketch, we can add our first shelf in. It's going to go from one side to the other. It's going to be material thickness in thickness. And we want to put some constraints in. We've already added a few constraints, namely the length constraint. So that's the distance between these two distances there. But there are a variety of other constraints, such as collinear for making two objects always, well, collinear, parallel, so on and so forth. In this case, we're just going to add another dimension constraint. I'm going to select the bottom of the shelf and the top of the base. And I'm going to add, uh, change that to shelf height. Now, there's a few ways we can add in the rest of the shelves. We could, in the sketch, create a rectangular pattern. I'll briefly run you through that. So we select two things we want to create a pattern of and we can drag and drop. We could add more of them in so we've got our full five, but that's not exactly what we need. If we do it this way, when we extrude it, those will not create more shelves if we were to change the shelf parameter. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So we're going to stop the sketch here, go back to our home view, we're going to extrude out our shelf. So that was bookcase depth. Oops, we're not working there. And again, I'm going to change that to new body. Now, much like the rectangular pattern on a sketch, we can create a rectangular pattern just on bodies. So I'm going to select pattern bodies, select that shelf. We select a direction and then we just drag this up to give us a bit of idea of what we're doing. So we wanted a certain amount of uh, shelves. So we want shelf count minus one because we've already got this one here, the base. And if we hit OK then, well, we've got our five shelves, but they're not spaced correctly. So down in our history here, we can double click on this R pattern here and we can modify that. So we want distance to be shelf height by shelf count minus two. We've already got these, the base shelf we're creating a pattern of and the one below it. Hit OK and then that's 
uh, given us the correct spacing for our shelves. And this is where Fusion comes into its own, I think, and that's getting back to the parameters. So let's say you're designing something and someone comes along and changes their mind. So a good example in, in my situation is my wife constantly changes how many shelves or dimensions of something. Another example would be, say you've got a standard sort of design of a bookcase, but a client wants you to make one and they want more shelves. So we could go seven shelves. That's made our entire bookcase grow and it's added in the extra shelves. And we can also go the other way. We can go three. So we've got one, two, three shelves. We'll change that back to five because I think that's a good number. If you were to build this bookcase, you'd find pretty quickly that it's not overly stable. We don't have any real joinery, so we should probably add that in. Uh, to make it a little bit easier, I'm going to mirror the two signs, uh, so I only have to do the joinery once. I'm just going to remove this for now. And I am going to hide all but the first shelf. I'm going to create a new sketch on the inside of this bookcase. I'm just going to trace that shelf in. Stop the sketch. I can hide that shelf, show my sketches again. And now I can extrude in that data. So I want that to go negative, so into the workpiece. I'm going to do a cut. Material thickness divided by two. That's sort of your average dado strength thingy. Now, just like before, we want to be able to have this go all the way up and again, adjustable if we change any parameters. So we can do another uh, rectangular pattern. This time we've got the faces selected. So we want to repeat three faces of the data. So we'll just have to change our camera angle, our direction, we're going up, and I'm just going to hit enter for now. Obviously these are in the wrong spots. However, what I can do is change those parameters. Now, as I showed you before, you can open up the dialog again, or we can go into the change parameters uh, dialog and drill down to that second pattern extrusion. So I'm going to expand both my pattern extrusions so that I can easy, easily copy and paste all the values in. And if we look at that, we've got all of our datos in the right position. Can turn our shelves back on and while they're not entirely lined up correctly, they're still lined up vertically, which is what we want. So I can now select my side. I'm going to give that a better name so it's easier to follow along. A good practice is to get into naming all of your uh, bodies and components so that it's just easier to reference them later on. So we've only got one size to our bookcase and it's going to be even more wobbly than it was before. So instead of redrawing that on the other side and all, and having to then do all the joinery in, in it again, and then any changes I make need to be mirrored, uh, I'm going to create a component. So I'm right clicked on my side, create component from bodies. I'm going to create another copy of it. And the important thing to note that this is an instance or a copy of the side. So if I make a change to one component, it will affect the other for some things. Things like rotation, when I'm rotating the entire component, do not affect it. So if I move this out here, it hasn't affected the other component. However, if I drill down into the body, then rotate that, they'll both rotate. So. Uh, a component is a grouping or a collection of bodies and other features. And if you move that overall, it treats it individually. However, you drill down into the individual properties and then they are mirrored. Now, currently our other side is floating around in no man's land and does no good to anybody uh, in terms of strength and stability. So I could move this using the M command for move uh, wherever I like, but it can be very time consuming to drag that in exactly where I need it. So our second bookcase side is out in no man's land and offers nothing for stability. So we need to move that into position. Press M for move, select move components, not bodies. As I explained, that would move both of them. And I'm going to select a pivot point of the top front corner on the inside. I'm also going to select a direction. I want to go in X direction first. 
and I'm going to snap that to where I want it to mate up with, which is this point here. Now it's only moved it in one direction, so we then select the other direction and click twice. Sometimes it can be a little bit fiddly and that's moved it where we want. So hit OK. That's all good. We're going to capture those positions. As you can see, looking at the front view, none of our shelves actually fit into those dados. They're just a little bit too short. Now we could move the sides in or we could widen out the shelves. What I'm going to do is widen out the shelves and I'm going to select the shelves we've already got and I'm actually going to remove those. I'm going to turn our base shelf into a component. Give that a good name. Uh, and now I can make that fit. So first I'm going to turn off the second side. E for extrude and I'm going to extrude that out in material thickness and then move the whole shelf back negative material thickness by in half and that'll fit into the groove properly. Then I can repeat that um, rectangular pattern and now we have a component that will be rectangular patterned. Now, the advantage of doing it as a pat as a component when we're patterning it rather than a um, body is that now when I manipulate one of them, they'll all change. So for example, we might find that these edges are a little bit too sharp and people are cutting themselves or injuring themselves on the crisp corners. So we'll go into modify, fill it. Doesn't really matter which one we're selecting because we're selecting that on a body. And you can see as I adjust that, all of them change. So we might just give that a five millimeter round over, five millimeter radius round over, and then they all look correct. So while we're doing that, we may as well uh, put the fillet on all of the external surfaces, just like you normally would uh, when you're rounding over a piece of furniture. So I've gone down to modify fillet, and I'm now just selecting all of my edges. probably don't need the bottom there. And I'm going to put in 15 millimeters. Now that is far too much. So just like before, we can go into our history, double click that at any stage and change that to five. Or as before, we can go into parameters and change it from there. Probably the last thing that this bookcase needs other than perhaps some edge banding, those sort of things, is a back on it. Uh, a back on a bookcase adds significant strength. I'm just going to create a sketch and I want that based on this plane here. So it's going to give me a little rectangle there. So I'll just extend my rectangle out from the rounded over edge all the way up. Stop sketch. Select my backer, E for extrude, and probably a six mil ply or quarter inch would be fine. So we'll go six mil. Again, we need to drop that down to new body. This time I'm just gonna select new component, rename that component, backer, and we're pretty much done. In this episode, this is all we're gonna cover. In the subsequent episodes, we will look at texturing so that we can make this look a lot prettier.